Hello, welcome back. I'm not at my whiteboard today. I wanted today's video to be a little bit more informal and low key and uh, a little bit more story based and experiential based. So I'm just gonna sit in front of my beautiful paintings and um, show them off a little bit to my YouTube world. Uh, my Instagram followers see these all the time because I do a lot of my reels with them, but you guys on YouTube don't really get to see the paintings very much. So I thought this would be a fun way to do a video. Um, this video, you know, I'm answering a question that some of you guys have asked me before, but really this goes back to younger Nikki. Uh, so those of you, I'm sure a lot of you know, but just in case, I had IBS. Looking back, I think it was SIBO. Um, I had all the symptoms. It behaved very SIBO-y. Um, the things that ultimately did work for me were very SIBO-y in nature. Um, but I had IBS, so I had really bad bloating and abdominal distension. I was actually asked once if I was pregnant when I was not pregnant. So I lived every woman's nightmare. Um, and I had very bad diarrhea-based IBS. And I was cutting out foods left and right. You name it. Not FODMAPs, because that was this was like 2010, 2011. So low FODMAP diet was only just beginning to be a thing at like Monash. But... Everything else practically I cut out at some point or another. And one of the questions that I had that nobody really had a good answer for or not a satisfactory answer for was whether or not food sensitivities could go away, right? Like, is it a lifelong thing or is it a temporary thing? And if it's temporary, could we define temporary? Um, and, you know, I was, I was going to a lot of functional medicine seminars and I was learning with these, these bright, brilliant minds. Um, and it's funny because like different people had very different flavors of, of how they would approach something or how they would answer something and their opinions. And that was kind of dissatisfying because I just wanted like the answer. I didn't want opinions. Um, but I remember thinking that it was a forever thing. Like based off of the predominant people that I was learning from, like Datis Karazian, the, the kind of message that I got a lot was, nope, these are never again foods. If you eat these again, you're a damn fool and they're just, they're going to wreck your body. Um, so luckily for me, I did eventually get to a point where I was able to reintroduce a lot of foods that weren't sensitivity issues. They were more of like intolerances. Uh, but the couple that were diagnosed via food sensitivity testing that I did have reactions to, gluten, dairy, uh, sesame, and for a while, potatoes, those stayed out of my diet for quite some time. And I remember thinking, okay, my immune system made antibodies to this. It remembers that this is a bad thing. And therefore, if I eat some sesame or some potato or some dairy, I'm going to, I'm going to poke the bear. I'm going to wake up the bear and it's going to rear its ugly head. And I'm going to be right back to square one. Uh, but then something curious happened. I, uh, over, over a period of a couple of years, I started to either get braver or get curious or just have some accidents. Uh, so as I, I healed my gut and my gut was doing significantly better. The first one for me was potatoes because I, love potatoes so much. <laughs> like I have two nutritional vices, you guys, truly I do. Dark chocolate and potato chips. Oh my God. Like those are my two things. Um, and I don't have them all the time, but they are a really satisfying little treat. Like I could take or leave, you could get rid of all the cake on planet earth or all the ice cream on planet earth. And I wouldn't be that bummed about it. But if you took away all the potato chips on planet earth, I would be devastated. So anyway, so um, I refrained from potato chips and potatoes in general for quite some time. And then, uh, I don't know, like I just got sick of it. <laughs> I just missed them. And if I went out for breakfast, you know, I, I had already figured out that I was a celiac and that wheat was a never again item to the best of my knowledge. So if I went out for breakfast with friends, I couldn't get the pancakes. I couldn't get the waffles. The thing that I would get was hard over hard eggs bacon or sausage and like hash browns or potatoes. And I, I took that out. Um, so when my gut was doing quite a lot better, um, this was, you know, a couple years into my IBS journey, probably about three years. I total, I was working on this. Um, as my gut got a lot more stable and a lot more happy, 
Um, I remember just going out and thinking, all right, maybe, maybe it's a quantity issue. Like I will just have the, the, the sauteed, you know, breakfast potatoes. And then I won't do any other potatoes for a while on either side of that. Um, and that seemed to work. Like I, I figured out that I was actually able to tolerate that one serving of potatoes when I went out for breakfast or brunch or whatever it was. And then I was pretty okay with that. And then I eventually got curious and I was like, all right, if I can tolerate that on a very sporadic basis, maybe I could have, maybe I'm good enough now that I could have like two servings in a week. And I could. And that's basically the story of, of how I introduced potatoes again was I just got sick of it and I missed potatoes a lot. So um, I just, I reintroduced them and it seemed to go pretty okay. So, but you know, I had had very severe symptoms from sesame and dairy and gluten again with the celiac thing. So I kind of chalked it up to, well, that was like the lowest number on all of the sensitivity testing. So it was barely positive to begin with. Therefore, that's why I was able to heal that. So I kind of just shrugged it off as, ah, eh, that was a really low grade sensitivity anyway, but the other three were much bigger for me. So I probably went another five years without eating any of the others. And um, there was a really great vegan restaurant in Chapel Hill, right, right near my, my office. And uh, I went there a couple of different times and depending on the server, I would ask like, okay, is, is there sesame in this or tahini? And I was assured there was not. Well, come to find out that my regular item that I would get when I went there, and by the way, I would go to this place like once every other month. It was amazing. Unfortunately, it closed. Um, but I would go there moderately frequently. And one fateful day, I, I happened to go there and the, the waiter that day, I, you know, I said, you know, I'll get the such and such. And I had asked about tahini or sesame for another dish that I was like an appetizer. And he was like, oh, but wait, you can't have that. It has tahini paste in it. And my mind was blown. <laughs> like I had been avoiding sesame for years and I had had this dish loaded with tahini paste no less than five times. And I felt completely fine from it. And sure enough, he brings like the binder with the recipes in it. And it said right there, tahini. I was like, oh my God. And I remember I was with my mom and I was like, try not to freak out. And then I got curious and I thought, okay, wait, when my head was out of it, I was able to eat this and I was perfectly fine. Wait a minute. What if, what if this has gone away? What if I'm better? So, um, so I intentionally ordered like falafel or something that had sesame like on it, like visible sesame seeds. And I remember when he put the plate in front of me, I got kind of freaked out. Again, I'd been eating, I had been eating sesame seeds several times for the months prior, but seeing the sesame seeds kind of freaked me out. So I remember I had to sit there. Luckily it was with my mom and I just, you know, I was like, you go ahead and start eating. I have to take some deep breaths. And I just sat there in the middle of the restaurant and closed my eyes and put my hand on my stomach. And I just had to breathe for a couple of minutes, you guys, like I was pretty freaked out seeing those sesame seeds because they had caused some really gnarly pain and diarrhea before and, and bloating. And, uh, I just did some deep breathing for a couple of minutes. I enjoyed the falafel or what I think it was like falafel with like sesame seeds on the outside and I enjoyed it. It was freaking scrumptious. And I went, I remember I went back to my office and I thought, okay, okay. Even if it does give me diarrhea, I don't have another appointment for an hour. I had like a chunk of time where I was just going to be answering emails and YouTube comments and stuff. So I was like, I've got a good hour. If I have to run up to the bathroom, I think I can clear out my colon and make it back for the appointment. And then nothing happened and I was perfectly fine. So there was another year or two where I was eating sesame just very occasionally as a treat. Like if I went to a Mediterranean restaurant, for example, and then eventually I just reintroduced it into my diet. And now I I'll get like store-bought hummus with tahini paste in it and stuff. Um, the last one for me was dairy. And that was very recent actually. 
Um, again, you go to these functional medicine seminars and you hear these brilliant, brilliant, brilliant people speaking and they're so compelling and they're so confident and they're so well educated. You can't help but believe them. And um, Datis Karazian in particular was one of these, but I remember a lot of these smart people saying that the absolute evils of our world are gluten, dairy, um, and to some extent, some people would say soy and corn. Like those are just the evils. They're evil for everybody. They're inflammatory for everybody. Why on earth would you eat that, you damn fool? And um, so now we're a good, you know, nine, 10 years past my time with IBS. So I have been free of IBS for about 10 years. All of this just happened in the last few months. And um, last summer, we got these gluten-free graham crackers and we were making s'mores and I had eaten like two or three of them. And I, I remember commenting, oh, this one's really good. And then I looked at the label and the first or second ingredient was butter. It's like, oh, <laughs> huh. And I remember, you know, it was like an hour later that I looked at the ingredients. So it was way too late to take a digestive enzyme and I was okay. And I didn't think much of it. I just thought, okay, maybe it's a low enough ingredient that, it, you know, it was barely anything. Uh, cut to, so that was last summer. This year, um, I moved to a new town. And when we moved here, I knew of a bakery and like coffee shop that was completely gluten-free, dedicated gluten-free. And when I went there the first time with my daughter, they had gluten-free eclairs. Oh, they just, they called my name. <laughs> they called my name. I... I, that was one of my favorite things when I did eat gluten and dairy and it looked so good and I just decided the heck with it. I'm just going to try it. And again, I had the same mentality. I was like, well, by the time I get home, I'll be able to get to the toilet and no harm, no foul. And I was able to eat the eclair and nothing happened. Like I was fine. So, and now I've, I've played a little bit here or there with like very low doses of actual dairy and it seems okay now i'm not going to run out at at least my current state i'm not running out and getting like a huge brick of cheese or a regular pint of ice cream like i still generally do the dairy free stuff uh just out of kind of caution and habit but it's really fascinating because again the the predominant dialogue and the predominant message when i was learning about functional medicine in the early days and when I was first diagnosed and I was first learning this is OMG, the immune system never forgets. This is an immune system thing. Once your immune system identifies a food as an enemy, forget about it. It's never again thing. And I'm living proof that that appears to not be true. That I think it, it might not be that the immune system forgets per se, but that the immune system becomes more tolerant over time. Like it remembers, oh yeah, I used to think that was the enemy but I've learned to tolerate stuff better now. Um, and for, for the last little bit of this probably rambling video, um, I wanted to give you some, some food for thought and some action steps that you can think about implementing. So when we talk about food allergies or food sensitivities, what we're actually talking about, like what they would call it in the medical literature and the research is a loss of tolerance to food. So normally your immune system should see a lot of stuff every day, all day, every day. Your immune system should see millions of different compounds from food, bacteria, yeast, uh, compounds that are made by your own body, um, compounds that are coming in and out of your body all day, every day. And your immune system should recognize the majority of those as harmless and it should tolerate them. So in research, they would call this loss of tolerance when you start reacting to weird stuff. Now you can lose self-tolerance. That's what would happen with autoimmunity. You can lose tolerance to chemicals, loss of chemical tolerance. That's where you get like migraines from perfume and like the smell of bleach and like chemical kind of stuff sets you off. That's loss of chemical tolerance. And then we have loss of food tolerance. Uh, all three of those have similarities and similar kind of profiles of immune function. 
But what I'll share is that if you want a really wild ride on PubMed, look up induction of tolerance or how to induce tolerance. And some of the biggest things for inducing tolerance, whether it be to chemicals or food or your own self tissue, some of the big things seem to be vitamin D. Um, here in the States, at least with our units, I tend to aim for vitamin D levels in blood around 50, 60, 70. I don't know if you need to push it higher than that, but certainly you want to get it above 50 if you can. Um, vitamin A, you can actually measure that in blood. I do it all the time through LabCorp. It's a great thing to check in on because some people are really wicked deficient. Uh, but vitamin A and vitamin D are very, very good at inducing tolerance. Um, yes, anti-inflammatories like turmeric and fish oil and resveratrol to a certain extent can help with that, but not quite as profoundly. And short chain fatty acids like butyrate. Butyrate in particular is really great at inducing tolerance. And one important thing to know is the more restricted your diet becomes, the more you lose variety in your diet, particularly the variety of plant foods. So like when I was hacking out lots of different foods on my quest to find the evil food that was triggering my IBS, by the way, it wasn't, it wasn't food. Um, as you cut out more foods out of your diet, that reduces the diversity and the abundance of butyrate producing bacteria that you have. And then you have lower short chain fatty acid levels and lower short chain fatty acid levels begets you more leaky gut, more colon inflammation, and a loss of tolerance. So one of the absolute best things you can do to gain tolerance back to foods that you genuinely are reacting to is to reintroduce all the other foods. So if you have, say like a food sensitivity, say you're like me and it's like gluten, dairy, sesame, say you have food sensitivities, and you're also doing low FODMAP or low histamine or some other restricted diet, the best thing you can do to win those foods back is to add in the ones that you're intolerant to by supporting your digestion, supporting your gut, modulating your microbiome, enhancing motility, doing all of that stuff we talk about on this channel. But if you can get your gut and your body healthy and resilient enough that you can add in the high FODMAP foods or the high fiber foods or the complex carbs or the plant foods, that is going to increase the diversity and the amount of short chain fatty acids that you can produce and the bacteria that produce them. And that's going to tell your immune system, Hey man, chill out. You don't need to freak out when you see sesame. It's okay. It's a sesame seed. It's not going to kill you. Um, so that's my best pro tip for inducing tolerance. Luckily I stumbled on this and I did that naturally. And I didn't know about inducing tolerance per se. Like I knew about some immunology and some TH17, TH3, TH1, TH2. Like I knew about that, but I hadn't heard the term induction of tolerance until many years later. And for what it's worth, it worked for me. Now, again, like defining temporary, now that we hopefully established that food sensitivities can be temporary, uh, I do think that it might take a significant amount of time to really heal and really recover from whatever's going on with your body. And it might take a while for your immune system to really calm down and start becoming tolerant again, or forgetting if you want to look at it that way. So for me, again, it, I, I went without potatoes for probably about a year before I slowly started reintroducing them. And there was probably another six months where I was having them very infrequently. Then, um, it was probably another four to five years. So it was probably five or six years total that I didn't touch sesame. And I only reintroduced that a handful of years ago. And then I went another three, four, five years before I attempted dairy. So, you know, go at the speed that you're comfortable with and your, and your comfort level should dictate a lot more of it. Uh, cause if you freak yourself out, you're going to react to the food, whether it's immunological or neurological in nature. Um, but for what it's worth, it might take a year or two to get certain foods back in your diet. It might be quicker than that. But from my experience, it is absolutely possible to reintroduce foods that you are sensitive to. The only ones that I would say no to right now, just based off of safety and current research is I would still work with an immunologist or an allergist 
if you're going to attempt any sort of reintroduction with foods that you are allergic to, like anaphylactic, it's not worth risking your life doing it yourself. Make sure that you work with somebody who could potentially save your life if need be. And um, if you're a celiac, there's still not a known cure for celiac disease. Maybe in my lifetime there will be, but for right now, if you're a celiac like me, make sure that you are gluten-free. That's another one where I think it would be more, um, more smart to just keep that out of your diet for right now. But sky's the limit with basically all the others. Did you know? <laughs> Did I look like, like Frankenstein's monster there? That's what I was going for. Did you know that FODMAP Freedom is enrolling kind of soon? If you haven't joined the wait list yet, make sure you get on it. Remember, this is the last time we're doing FODMAP Freedom until next year. If you miss the August enrollment, you will be waiting until 2023. If you join the wait list now, not only do you get first dibs on enrollment, which is pretty clutch because we almost ran out of spaces the last two times, but also you get a super sweet bonus gift that will help you with your healing. So make sure you're on that wait list if you're even thinking about FODMAP Freedom. You're not committing to anything. You're not paying anything. It's just getting your name on there and saying, hey, I want to hear about it first. That's all it is. It's just a wait list. But make sure you get on that sooner rather than later because we're going to be opening the doors again in just another week or two in August. And I cannot wait to help you guys heal your guts even more in depth and answer your questions in our weekly Q&As. I'll see you then. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.